Professor Roland Martin and Dr. Elias Jelcic from the University of Zurich. Roland Martin is head of neuroimmunology and MS research, and Elias Jelcic is head of the MS outpatient clinic and also head of the stem cells transplantation program. With no doubt, they have nationwide, but also internationally, the biggest experience with the use of stem cells in treatment of MS, so we are more than happy that they accepted our limitation to cover the first topic today, stem cells transplantation in MS, what have we learned from the practice? Before we start, just one technical remark. There is obviously some gap between uh, you uh, asking the questions and the moment we can see them. So please don't hesitate to ask your questions as soon as possible. But now we are ready. Roland, Elias, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. I will start the presentation by sharing with you our experience with stem cell transplantation in MS patients and me and then Ronan Martin will guide you through what we have learned from, from practice. So to understand the efficacy of stem cell transplantation, it's helpful to um, recap re recapitulate the concept of NEDA3. NEDA3 is an abbreviation for no evidence of disease activity and includes absence of relapses, meaning clinical activity, absence of MRI activity, and absence of increase in disability, meaning no progression. And you can find different definitions for this, neither free or event-free survival or disease-free survival. And what you can do is to compare how many patients will have complete st stable disease course, meaning NIDA3 status after two years, starting um, after, um, after two years after starting the treatment. And you can find a summary of the pivotal study data from all conventional disease modifying therapy, and you will find that the highly effective DMTs um, induce in only 13 to 46% of the patients are neither three status after two years, meaning only half of the patients are completely stable. And you see that placebo-treated um, patients do less fine, and you see that um, these are the data from stem cell transplantation um, trials in MS patients. You see that the efficacy is much higher, 60 to 90% of the MS patients um, two years after transplantation do have an either three status. And this is even after five years, a higher percentage compared to the conventional DMTs. So autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is a very effective therapy. And up to date, different treatment protocols have been used. Most commonly, the BEAM ATG protocol, um, but also more intense protocols. And they differ regarding the intensity of myeloablation and lymphoablation. These are two complicated words, but this means that um, the chemotherapy hits the whole hematopoietic bone marrow compartment. And with the lymphoablation, um, mainly the lymphocytes are targeted. And we know that there is a probably a threshold and in myeloablative protocols, usually you have to rescue um, the patient with the hemato retransfusion of hematopoietic stem cells to recover the hematopoietic system and, and in order to let the patient survive the treatment. Without retransfusion of stem cells, those patients was, would most probably die. And in recent years, other protocols which are more lymphoablative and less myeloablative or non-myeloablative are being used. For example, cyclophosphamid and ATG, antithymocytoglobulin. And here, hematopoiesis, the whole immune system, and um, uh, can recover without the retransfusion of hematopoietic stem cells. Um, albeit, this would need a longer recovery. And here you see other centers like Moscow and Russia or Mexico City, they use cyclophosphamide and rituximab, which is even more or less lymphoablative and certainly not myeloablative. So here you wouldn't need any retransfusion of stem cells. So what we do here is an autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for MS. And um, 
the Swiss Federal Office of Public Health has approved a HSCT in MS since the 1st of July of 2018, based on the growing evidence that it is a highly effective therapy. And to receive reimbursement and to be eligible for a HSCT, the following criteria were defined. So the patient must have inflammatory breakthrough activity of MS despite highly effective disease-modifying treatment. Indication has to be set by the interdisciplinary hematoneuroimmunological board at the University Hospital of Zurich. And third, the patient has to participate in a registry for five years after the transplantation for safety reasons. And what we do here in Zurich is to use the BEAM ATG protocol. And this is a four step procedure. So, in the beginning, here you see a slide where all the um, steps are depicted. In the first step, we do a mobilization of um, hematopoietic stem cells into the peripheral blood by treating the patient with cyclophosphamide and GCSF. We, we call this the mobilization chemotherapy. And in the next step, these peripheral stem cells are collected via leukopheresis from the peripheral blood and frozen in liquid nitrogen. And the patient then, after, let's say, three to four weeks, comes in for the conditioning chemotherapy. This is a toxic high-dose chemotherapy. And here we use the BEAM ATG protocol. BEAM stands for BCNU, etoposite, um, cytorabine, and melphalan. And two days later, antitimosid globulin is applied. We use a dose of cumulatively 7.5 milligram per kilogram body weight. And then in the end, the thawed um, product with the um, stem cells is retransfused into the patient. And out of this um, retransfused stem cells, within two weeks, a new immune system develops. This is the principle of the treatment. We have treated now 38 patients um, until December 2021. And we have, again, three um, more patients, which we have to transplant in the next weeks. So what kind of patients have we transplanted until now? Um, here's the baseline demographics of 35 patients. And you see that in average, the patients were 40 years old, had a disease duration of nine to 10 years, and um, a an, an median EDSS of roughly 4.0. And we have treated a little bit more um, women than men, 19 women, 16 men. And um, nearly half of the patients, 45%, had a relapsing remitting MS course, 28% a secondary progressive MS course, and 25% um, had a primary progressive disease course. And we have treated these patients because of relapses in 43% of the patients, because of radiological activity, meaning new or contrast-enhancing lesions in 60% of patients, and or clinical progression in half of the patients. And they had these breakthrough activity despite highly effective approved immunomodulatory treatment. And you can see that two thirds of the patients had CD20 depleting therapy with rituximab or acrylizumab, mainly the progressive patients. One third of the patients were pretreated with fingolimod and had this breakthrough activity under fingolimod and four patients had breakthrough activity under natalizumab, meaning this was a highly, um, highly active disease um, um, population. Now, what is the outcome? Here you see the data for event-free survival. So the median follow-up is nearly two years. We have one patient, uh, one patient which we followed up now for um, more than five years. And um, there were no relapses and no MRI activity until now. And we have observed sustained EDSS worsening, which was confirmed in two visits, which were at least six months apart. And here you see that NIDA3 status was achieved 
um, after 12 months, meaning after one, um, one year after the transplantation, in 81% of all patients, 81% um, of, of relapsing remitting and 81% of progressive patients. This is very preliminary data. It's clear that we have to follow up and track the patients for a longer period. And what was very surprising for us and, and interesting to see, we can exactly reproduce the experience from other transplantation centers. So we see changes in the EDSS from baseline to last follow-up after transplantation. Here you see the data available in 35 patients. And the median follow-up again was nearly two years. And what you see here is the comparison the, the change of the EDSS score from baseline, meaning from transplantation, to the last follow-up. So minus means the patient improved in the EDSS, the EDSS went down, and um, here are the patients who worsened, who even got a worse EDSS score, um, um, uh, status. So what you see here is that 57% of the patients improved their EDSS, and um, in some cases, really considerably. So EDSS improvement of four points or two points. And you see that um, nearly 70% of the patients with improvement had a rel relapsing remitting disease course. Um, only half of the patients had a progressive disease course. In orange, you see the patients with secondary or primary progressive disease course. And in blue, patients with a relapsing remitting disease course. 22% of the patients stabilized with their EDSS after treatment. And in 20% of the patients, we saw an EDSS worsening. In 28% of, of the patients had a relapsing remitting course, and 70% had a progressive disease course. Here you see one patient who was labeled relapsing remitting MS before transplantation, but developed secondary progression after transplantation. So from this, um, we have the first clue that probably relapsing remitting MS patients benefit better from transplantation than progressive patients. What about safety? Here you see the data from safety signals from the first two years. Unfortunately, we have to um, report two deaths. Both patients had a secondary progressive disease course both committed assisted suicide via exit approximately two years after transplantation because they had the feeling that progression is going on and they didn't, um, didn't want to tolerate this. Um, the, the sad thing is that they had an EDSS stable disease course on the paper, so we couldn't, um, um, yeah, we couldn't, um, proved that they had a, really a progression. So this was out of um, not transplantation related reasons, both patients had um, committed um, a suicide. Here you see that adverse events cluster shortly after transplantation. So here you see in red, severe adverse events, and blue, in blue, moderate adverse events, and in green, mild adverse events. Most of them occur shortly. Here you see the timeline in days, so um, 700 days depicted. Uh, in the first days after transplantation, most of side effects occur. There was no clear association of frequency or severity of adverse events with age or degree of neurological disability. And what about the types of adverse events? Um, we saw that in the beginning, meaning in the first uh, 20 to 50 days after transplantation, um, the infectious and mucotoxic adverse events predominate in the early phase. Um, most commonly, we observed mucositis and enteritis, meaning diarrhea after the chemotherapy in more than 80% of the patients is a typical side effect of the high-dose chemotherapy in nearly half of the patients, an upper airway infection and urinary tract infections in third, um, um, one third of the patients. We haven't seen malignancies in the first two years. Um, and we saw 
as a noticeable early infectious adverse event, in few cases, CMV reactivation. And, and this is true for two thirds of the CMV seropositive patients. So what we introduced here is a prophylactic treatment with latermovir. This is a um, CMV specific antiviral agent and which, um, it's, which is very effective in, in blocking CMV reactivation. And this we give for in the early three months. And since then, um, we have consider considerably less problems with, uh, um, um, with uh, CMV reactivation. And there's a late infectious adverse event, which, uh, which is um, important to mention is, um, is Zoster, which occurred in five of 35 patients in one to two years after the transplantation. So this is, this is problematic because um, revaccination against um, Zoster with the live vaccine is allowed only two years after transplantation. So we've introduced um, a new vaccination scheme with a dead vaccine called Shingrix. And since then, we have the feeling that we have less problems with um, Zoster. So to conclude for the first part, um, regarding efficacy, um, we observed that beam, um, the transplantation using the beam ATG protocol induces high frequency of stabilization and even improvement in patients who experienced prior breakthrough inflammatory disease activity, despite highly effective conventional disease modifying therapy. And the effect is probably more pronounced in relapsing remitting MS patients compared to progressive patients, but we need a longer follow-up to confirm this notion. Regarding safety, we think that the safety is overall acceptable, but transplantation with the beam ATG protocol requires early vigilant monitoring, especially regarding infectious diseases. And it requires optimized antimicrobial prophylactic care. And um, these two suicides um, forced us to really intensify psychiatric evaluation before transplantation and after transplantation. And before I hand over to um, Roland, um, I would like, um, like to thank all the people who, um, who contributed. It's uh, very important to stress that um, the um, interaction between neurology and the hematology department was very, very important um, to successfully treat these patients. And the interaction with the psychiatry and the fertility, fertility center and the federal office of public health was also very important. And now I will hand over to Roland. So hello, also good morning and uh, thank you Adam for the introduction and I will just continue with a few slides and uh, wrap up what Elias uh, so nicely introduced to you. So I will give you just a few uh, ideas about how this treatment works um, and also potential mechanisms beyond immune renewal. Um, what we currently discuss with respect to continuation of this program in Switzerland. So here you see one slide um, that summarizes um, what we currently think. So we think that uh, both genetic and environment, environmental risk factors, you have heard a lot about this probably lately, uh, contribute to uh, the risk to develop MS. And then uh, the main cells that drive the disease process are B cells and T lymphocytes. And they lead finally all together to this um, very variable disease course, um, um, very benign or severe in the patients that we treat here, primarily severe. And the focus of our mechanistic studies was on these two cell types. I just want to show you a few slides. So what you see here is uh, data from Josefine Ruder in our lab. She's uh, doing a, an, an MD PhD. And you can see that from before transplantation to two years afterwards, uh, naive T lymphocytes and uh, memory T lymphocytes, um, and then two other cell types that are effector memory uh, uh, lymphocytes, they recover with various uh, different speeds. And naive T cells, the ones that are newly formed, take a long time to recover and come close to their numbers pre transplantation. Whereas this cell type here, so called effector memory cell cells, recover very quickly. 
and this has a reason that I will come to. You can see here um, in um, when we look at the receptor repertoire, so the fingerprint of each T cell on their surface and ask the question, are the cells after transplantation the old ones that come back or are they new? You can see that in the early phase of the disease, after three months, the effect on memory cells 25% of them in red are cells that were present before the transplantation. So they were not completely eliminated. These go slowly down. After 12 months, there are only about 15% left of them. On the other hand, if you look at naive cells, the newly formed, you can see that um, 12 months after transplantation, all the naive cells, so everything that comes new to protect us from viral and bacterial infections are, are completely new everything green here. The TISA receptors are completely new ones. There's no old ones left. So the repertoire, particularly of these cells that, that are important on the long run, is completely new. We have a, a very fruitful and interesting collaboration with Johannes Krück and his laboratory in Valentin von Niederhäusern in the Children's Hospital here in Zurich. They are B cell experts, different from us. We are primarily known knowledgeable in, in T cells. And you can see that in the B cell compartment, um, some cells recover quite quickly and to higher levels than before um, and overshoot. But when you take the cells that produce antibodies, again, it takes a long time until they recover uh, completely. The reason why these numbers pre-transplant are so low is because many of our patients, as Elias introduced to you, had anti-CD20 treatment. So this uh, level would normally be higher. Yeah? But overall, uh, the antibody producing B cells also take a long time to come back, two years or even longer. Um, so let me just briefly conclude. So some T cells and few B cells survive stem cell transplantation transiently and early, but only for a short period of time. I didn't show you all the data that we have. The carryover T cells are senescent and exhausted. They have shorter telomeres showing that they are uh, old and likely to, to disappear quickly. And they proliferate less than the new cells. They are not fully functional. Otherwise, we would expect relapses after the procedure, and we don't see that. But the repertoire that comes new is completely different from the one before. And on the longer term, immune renewal is more and more complete. So when you look at the cells that are generated over the longer period of time, they're completely new. There are probably some other mechanisms that we in the moment uh, do not really pay too much at attention to. Our own data that is already um, published and uh, from long time ago showed in animals that the microglia compartment is most likely not renewed. This is different from this uh, paper from Eva Meze's group. So this probably needs to be reassessed. But they likely do change their phenotype. So we don't know too much about this right now. What I didn't show you is that other so-called innate immune cells like natural killer cells that are important for defending us against viruses, they change in their phenotype and have a more regulatory phenotype. It is not clear which effects the stem cell transplantation has in the central nervous system. One thing that is very interesting is that the atrophy rate, so the loss of brain tissue that is increased in MS patients to five to 10 fold over the normal range completely normalizes beginning from one year after the stem cell transplantation. So the loss of brain tissue goes back to normal levels like we see it in the healthy control. And the latter point indicates that whatever drives chronic inflammation in the brain and meninges, even the so-called silent disease is probably stopped. But this needs more data. And whether there is true regeneration of tissue, including the brain, is currently not clear. I just want to highlight to you there are studies there from Eva Meze at the NIH that showed that in women who received an allotransplant from a man, she could show that there are new neurons in the brain after stem cell transplantation that have the Y chromosome, that they come from the, from the uh, donor of the stem cell graft. Yeah? So there is probably some uh, differentiation from hematopoietic cells into neuronal cells. Here you see one of our patients, a young man, and he had also some interesting finding. He had, um, this was his hair color before the transplant. And you can see after the stem cell transplantation, he has these large islands of brown hair. So a darker skin uh, uh, and hair pigment 
before we come from CD34 hematopoietic stem cells that also go into the hair follicles and have switched on a different pigmentation program here. So let me um, come to what would hopefully be done in the future. Um, we have to consider here to implement a, a lighter HSCT protocol. You saw that uh, the side effects um, are, are um, quite, quite frequent, uh, particularly early. Hopefully we will find a, a new protocol that uh, replaces the chemotherapeutic drugs and um, the combination of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in the future with tolerance induction could set the threshold for newly developing disease even higher. We need to understand the CNS effects and hopefully better outcomes and biomarkers for measuring disability accrual, silent disease activity and other things. This is my last slide. So what is currently um, being considered? Um, you heard from Elias uh, that the procedure is uh, in the moment only approved here in Zurich, but we have from the beginning on discussed with the BAG to broaden the approval to other Swiss MS centers, and particularly to have at least one center in each language zone in um, the Ticino and, and in the Western part of Switzerland. Uh, this will require an approved protocol at each site. And what we wanted to do is in, invite all of you who are interested at your center to begin with this procedure to contact us so that we can talk about this. One very important requirement is what Elias uh, emphasized a lot is both the MS center and the transplant experts need to be interested and tightly work together. And with that, we would like to thank you and take questions. I will give the headset to Elias first, yeah? Thank you, Roland. Thank you, Elias, for this uh, excellent, and clear, comprehensive overview and for sharing your experience. There are indeed few questions incoming as we speak. Maybe the first comment or question, as you know, there is some skepticism about the method and the opponents often argue that we first have to use old available highly active drugs before we consider stem cell transplantation. I refer to the ongoing Nordic, Nordic trial with, with alemtuzumab, comparing the effect of alemtuzumab versus stem cell transplant. Who is the ideal candidate in your eyes for the transplant? Do we wait too long? Uh, I refer to patients with relapse and creating multiple sclerosis, yeah. basically. Yeah, who, uh, that's a very, very important question. What's the ideal patient? So I have, I must say, we, we, we went through the same experience like the Australians or the, the UK um, and the Swedish uh, colleagues. Um, so all concluded in the end that it's better to, to transplant relapsing remitting patients with a highly inflammatory disease course with breakthrough activity early in the disease course meaning in the in the first years not too too late in the disease course i think this is um this is very important there is early few data now um 20 patients who were transplanted because of super aggressive beginning of the disease course they were transplanted by first hand i think we are not there yet i think it's it's correct we have to first try conventional disease modifying therapies but we shouldn't wait too long and, and react early if we see that even with very efficient um, um effective um and very active disease modifying therapies we don't have complete disease control we should consider this this treatment in the end only a minority of patients will be eligible for transplantation thank you very much uh, another personal comment from my side i have two maybe three patients per year who goes to moscow or to mexico to get transplant, obviously patients who do not fulfill the inclusion criteria of your program. It, it leaves me always with some sort of mixed feelings. I can understand the motivation, but what is your personal opinion about patients with mostly secondary progressive uh, course or primary progressive course who do not fulfill our nationwide criteria and decide to get transplant approved? Um, yeah. Do you have any data? Is there any exchange with the colleagues from Moscow or Mexico? No, unfortunately, we don't have any exchange with the colleagues from Moscow. Um, and I think one big drawback is that they don't follow up the patients. So yes, some patients report back um, an EDSS, which they assessed on their own. But this is no objective EDSS. There's no objective 
monitoring, long-term monitoring of these patients after transplantation. And there's another um, point I showed you that the intensity of the treatment in Moscow is much less than the intensities used commonly, this cyclophosphamide the ATG protocol and the BEAM ATG protocol. So there are studies indicating that less intensive protocols are less effective on the long run. And I personally think we don't hit the uh, disease progression if we do the transplantation. So I think it's not very useful that um, patients expose themselves to chemotherapy associated risks if there is no use um, for them. Yeah? So meaning patients with a progressive disease course, unfortunately, without any inflammatory activity, I think they, they won't benefit um, too much from, from transplantation. Thank you. There's another question. Maybe you, Roland, could answer this topic, normalization of brain atrophy. Normalization of brain atrophy one year after transplantation. Was this found only in patients with relapsing remitting MS or also in progressive patients? This is reported, um, but the data, as you can imagine, is still incomplete because the numbers are not too high. Uh, but we see it in, in both. And I think a particularly challenge will be, like Elia said, on the one hand, the relapse remitting patients seem to be very well suited if they're highly active, but identify the progressive patient that would also profit. Uh, this is probably a subgroup that we cannot fully identify yet. But with respect to atrophy, I don't think that there is based on the data that I'm aware of, a difference between the two. Thank you again. And last question, would you exclude patients of transplantation where they would not exclude exit as an option to end their life if there is a disease worse than ink? So there are a few comments about this, uh, suicides in your patient program. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think... Um, like Ilya said, we have realized that it is very important to take the psychiatric uh, well-being of patients uh, uh, carefully into consideration, um, uh, look at them beforehand, discuss all these things openly with them, have as tight uh, a report as possible with the patient, and then follow them afterwards also and periodically involve the psychiatrist. I think we cannot give a general recipe how to deal with this. It's just something that requires being aware of the issues um, and, and discussing them uh, with patients and making sure that they are not overly um, optimistic about the outcome afterwards. And if then some, something comes that they did not uh, want to have happened, um, that, that this is not ending in disaster like in these two patients. Thank you very much. There are no more questions. So I would like to thank you again for the excellent presentation.